Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark Green, Ambassador Green. I'm the President and CEO of the Wilson Center. Before I came to the Wilson Center, I was the Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. I'm sometimes asked if there was anything that I saw as Administrator that surprised me, if there was anything that I wasn't prepared for. And quite frankly, it was the scope and scale of human displacement all around the world. Simply put, people are not where they were and not where they're going to be, and it touches every single part of the globe. 84 million people are displaced, and that's before we take into account Ukraine. I think we all recognize that the humanitarian needs for those who are displaced are unprecedented. Emergency shelter and medicine and food. My friend David Beasley at the World Food Program likes to refer to biblical levels of need. But you know, in some ways, that's the easy part, the humanitarian assistance. This is a generous world. And we are a generous people. And I do believe that we will come through and meet those obligations. But what worries me even more is that in the last two years, one million children were born displaced. Mm -hmm. They are growing up displaced. And the long-term needs for children and women in particular, the vulnerabilities, we're quite frankly at risk of losing an entire generation. At the Wilson Center last fall, we dedicated the Wilson Quarterly, an issue entirely to this matter of human displacement. We had articles, contributions from King Abdullah of Jordan, Ivan Duque of Colombia, the World Food Program, and UNICEF, and we called this Humanity in Motion. In recent weeks, we've launched an initiative called Humanity in Motion, to try to find ways to elevate the issue, but also to identify some of the long-term policy changes and answers that we think we all must find if we're going to find a way to not lose a generation of people all around the world. Uh, today and right here is a particularly important place, particularly good place to have this conversation. I think as we all recognize our host country of Qatar, has done a remarkable job in helping particularly with respect to Afghanistan and helping those who are displaced, and I think we all owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. It's also a good place because of the panelists that we have with us here today. Filippo Grande, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Elise Nelson of Vital Voices, Jordanian Foreign Minister Safadi, Greek Minister of Migration, Mitarakis. All of these individuals have substantial experience in this great challenge that we see. To get things going, I'm going to turn inevitably to you, Filippo. And the subject, I guess, of the day may be the subject that's on everybody's lips, and that is Ukraine. What's the latest with uh, displacement in and from Ukraine? Thanks, Mark. And uh, good afternoon, everybody including my fellow panelists. I, uh, well, just to be very factual, I think many people know already, but this is, um, continues to be a displacement crisis of major proportion. You mentioned 84 million displaced and refugees around the world. These, are, these were our latest statistics. One can easily say there are 94 now, because you have to add 10 million that were displaced in Ukraine, either in the country, 600 million, or outside as refugees in neighboring countries, we are approaching 4 million. I think we'll probably get to 4 million by the end of the week. So um, this is, you know, numbers, of course, hardly describe tragedy, the human tragedy, but they are also quite incredibly large numbers in one month, in just over a month. Um, it's mostly women, children. I, I, you know, that was the most striking feature when I visited first in Poland, in Moldova. I saw the people coming at the very beginning. It's incredible that it is a huge stream of women and children, and the men are left behind for the reasons that we know. But this also 
raises a lot of other challenges, exposure, protection, risks, and, and so forth. Um, temporary protection in Europe, we were just discussing this with Minister Mitaraki, has helped because at least for Ukrainians uh, or people coming from Ukraine, people can spread around Europe without um, undue obstacles. It's actually a very interesting precedent for the future, I think, for Europe, that this has been activated after 20 years, a very old uh, uh, directive that has been activated. But before I conclude, I want to just add in line with what you just said, Mark. I think that where, besides the humanitarian challenges, the uncertainty about the future, we are very much afraid now that a war of attrition may substitute the very rapid invasion that we have seen in the last few weeks, and that comes with a lot of humanitarian challenges, but we're also looking at other places, and we're looking at um, ODA being, humanitarian assistance maybe, but certainly ODA being impacted because of the colossal resources that are being poured in by Western donors in particular to respond to uh, the crisis. And lowering the guard in all the other crises would be catastrophic, be it the Syria response that we've been handling with Ayman and many others for the past uh, 11 years, Afghanistan, where I was just a few days ago, and the list is very, very long. So just something that I think is worth maybe having a few words about is this potential impact that is of great concern to us. And if I can, just to continue on, uh, you took a trip back to Afghanistan just recently, and if I I think I read your quote that you wanted to make sure they realized that they hadn't been forgotten. Do you think that is a risk? Obviously, right now, today, everyone immediately thinks of Ukraine. Is there a risk that we forget about all of the other crises that are taking place? Yes, and it is a double um, for, forgetfulness. One is in terms of resources, of course, and the other one in terms of the political investment that is always needed to resolve the crisis because if you don't address the political roots you you know you cannot be in crisis response mode forever so i am worried afghanistan in itself has its own set of challenges i think the taliban with this last decision did not make life easy for those of us who want to continue to engage with them we will continue to engage with them but they haven't made it easy and in an in a context in which there is a As Afghanistan is once again on the agenda. I feel like in the news from page Afghanistan, I mean, it is Ukraine and we know that that is important. Um, but, you know, I, I'm reminded of one of the bold Afghan women leaders. She's a poet, Shafika, very young, in her 20s. Most of her family is still in Afghanistan. So I know she wouldn't want me to tell you any more than that about her. But we were on a call the other day, and she said exactly this, that we are so worried that we are going to be forgotten. And in fact, uh, she's, she's one of the women we evacuated. We evacuated about 1,000 women leaders and their families, 1,000 people total. Most of them are um, in relocation waiting to be resettled. Most of them are in Albania, some in Greece. But one of the things that Shafika said is she said, you know, when the crisis in Ukraine hit, every door open to them, every border open to them. And what a beautiful thing that was to see. But for us in Afghanistan, every door remains closed. But I have to say, I, I am so honored to be on this panel and in this country, um, places where doors have opened. Um, and I think that that means so much because even just the solidarity of knowing that they're not alone. I think in terms of the situation in Afghanistan, all of us know it is one of the worst humanitarian crises on record. Um, and any time there's a crisis, humanitarian or otherwise, women and children, women in particular are always the greatest victims. We have actually seen a five-fold rise in extreme forms of gender-based violence. A lot of, um, obviously, domestic violence is very high because any time both in those communities where people have been evacuated and those still inside the country, anytime you're in limbo, that creates instability and instability often very much leads to, leads to domestic violence. So 
We need to keep it on the radar. We need to figure out how to do that. But I think, you know, Vital Voices, quite frankly, is not an organization that does humanitarian evacuations. And I think in so many ways, what we saw with so many individuals and organizations stepping up that don't normally charter planes, um, but I think that is probably the future. Because in addition to those 94 million, we know that climate change and this crisis coming is going to raise that number exponentially within just the next, I mean, we heard the, um, what was it, this morning, um, uh, the Maldives, the, the Prime Minister of the Maldives talking about 80% of that country underwater. Um, and so I think we need to be looking more broadly at other players. Um, and so I think someone who works in civil society and has done so for many years, I know that this is the future. It can't just be done by government and international organizations alone. Civil society, I think, will increasingly play a role. And if we uh, worry that somehow Afghanistan is at risk of being forgotten. Uh, Minister uh, of uh, Jordan, I will point to you, isn't there an even greater risk that Syrian refugees uh, are at risk of being forgotten? And your government, of course, has done extraordinary uh, work and been remarkably generous in hosting a million Syrian refugees is there a risk out of sight, out of mind? Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Green. Glad to be with, the, with this panel. And again, uh, big shout out to uh, our Qatari uh, brothers for, for hosting this event. Uh, uh, to your question, I think the Syrian refugees were already being forgotten even before Ukraine. Uh, we're the largest per capita host of refugees in the world. And our message to all our friends and partners was refugees cannot be the responsibility of host countries alone. This is a global responsibility and everybody got to do their share. Unfortunately, over the past few years, uh, we've been seeing uh, a very alarming decline in both attention to the refugees issues and in terms of support. Uh, being provided to refugees and to host uh, communities. And uh, Felipe heard me <laughs> say that many, many times before. Now with the Ukrainian crisis, I think we're already just making uh, a bad situation even, even uh, worse. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, refugees issues is going to uh, put further stress on the already stressed resources of uh, uh, international organizations. Uh, Everybody is trying to help. We in Jordan have declared that any Ukrainian who wants to come to Jordan will come uh, 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 without any visa limitations and, and will come to stay. Uh, our policy in Jordan from the get-go was we need to provide refugees with a dignified life because ultimately they're in the room. And investing in their education and their uh, livelihood is investing in our collective security because if we abandon refugees to bitterness, to need, to ignorance, then uh, we're really setting the scene for what will be a much, much worse situation in, in the future. Uh, you mentioned that 80% of, there are 80 million refugees. The fact is about 70% of these are from Arab and Muslim countries. You mentioned uh, millions of kids who are suffering or who are born in, in refugee camps. 50% of Syrians in Jordan are under the age of 15, which means they were either born in Jordan or they grew up in Jordan, and the only country they know is Jordan. Again, our policy in the kingdom has always been to try and, and provide them with whatever we can, but we can't do it alone. In the past, and we're, we're grateful for the support that we got from our partners, but that support is dwindling, and uh, refugees are the victims of crisis in their countries. We cannot victimize them again by ignoring them and abandoning their cause. That said, I think it's imperative as we focus on uh, doing our collective duty towards uh, refugees from Ukraine, we have to also uh, keep in mind that Palestinian refugees, Syrian refugees, Afghani refugees, other refugees are still in dire need. Uh, in Jordan, as I said, for the first time, we're starting to feel some negativity by our people towards refugees because at uh, Average unemployment, 25 pages of the paper. What we see every night, sadly, in the United States on TV is not going age are not going to school. So where are we going? And I think okay. the message that, that, that must resonate very clearly now is that, yes, 
we need to take care of, of Ukrainian refugees, but we cannot afford uh, to ignore other refugees. Uh, UNRWA, for example, uh, we've got 2.4 million registered uh, 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 refugees with UNRWA. Uh, 122,000 kids of, of, uh, go to Jordanian schools. Two, three, 263,000 kids go to UNRWA schools in Gaza. If they do not go to school, they're going to the street. And we all know the, 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 the implications of that. Every year we're in crisis mode. Are schools going to open or are they not going to open? And we have not been able to come up with a, with a sustainable uh, approach to dealing with this crisis. So uh, not to go on for, for long, my, my message here is that refugees are global responsibilities. Uh, they are being ignored. The consequences of that are dangerous. Uh, for all of us, uh, let's all remember that when refugees started crossing into Europe immediately after the Syrian crisis, we saw how much of, of, of challenges that caused. Uh, we uh, have to do what's right. And to those who are worried about refugees going to Europe, my simple answer is if refugees are provided with a dignified life in the immediate neighborhood, they're not going to go to Europe. And uh, the other lesson that we've learned in Jordan is that refugees hardly go back. Right. They don't go back. Uh, so that's a problem that's going to require all of us coming together. So, um, Mr. al Safadi, that was one of the striking elements of uh, His Majesty's contribution to the Wilson Quarterly was an open admission that they're, in fact, very unlikely to go back. And also uh, an admission that there is a burden, obviously, on the host community and the host country and yet, given that, and this panel is all about long-term and solutions, uh, your government issued 257,000 work permits for Syrian refugees a at a time when you mentioned there is youth unemployment. Why? And uh, what have been the impacts of that? So why? Because, again, they're there. They need to live. Uh, if they don't work, they're going to do whatever they and to provide for their families. Uh, we have to take the responsibility seriously. Uh, we need to make sure that, uh, again, they're able to provide their families and have a dignified life. Yes, 273,000 permits at a time of 50% unemployment among the youth. Uh, said 122,000, uh, 133 actually, uh, thousand kids go to the, our official education system. Some of our schools have to operate on a two shift or three shift basis. Uh, now, only 10% of refugees in Jordan live in refugee camps. 90% are spread across the country. Um, again, even before COVID, um, uh, less than 50,000 people uh, went back to Syria. And, and, and people ask, you know, we all speak in sort of legal language, voluntarily return and this and that. But look, the decision to go back comes back to a simple family conversation around supper by, among refugee family. Am I going to be able to provide for my kids? Will they have schools? Will I have a job? Will I be safe? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, people are not going to know. So again, this is why we also work as much as we can on also trying to resolve crises that were the reason for which those people left their homes to start with. Uh, absent uh, uh, political solutions to those crises, absent a collective effort to try and, and restore normalcy to those countries, uh, that is going to be a chronic problem, and that's going to be a problem that will stay with us for, for a long time. And again, we need to look at that in terms of a humanitarian perspective, security perspective, social perspective. Uh, so as I said, in Jordan, we do what we can. I have to say, you know, the first refugee in the world to be vaccinated during COVID was in Jordan, because again, our policy was, they are here, we got to do the right thing, and the right thing is to uh, give them hope, give them respect. Uh, uh, otherwise, there's so many spoilers out there that are going to try and prey on their misery and, and uh, direct their, their, their energies towards uh, 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 radicalism and other things. That would ultimately haunt us all. So again, this is a problem for all of us. Uh, we cannot afford to uh, uh, abandon refugees. And one thing I want to say is that we got to be very careful in our narrative as well. Uh, some narrative came out that was extremely dangerous when people in our region started to say there's a degree of discrimination here. Uh, that, you know, we see the mobilization towards Ukrainian refugees, which we believe is right. 
But again, some of the narrative that was used really resonated extremely negatively in the region. By the end of the day, they're all humans, they're all kids, they're all children, and they all need the same degree of attention. And we cannot wait just for crises to happen to act. If we act preventively, we can, we can spend less and, and achieve more. Minister Mit uh, Mitarachi, from the European perspective, uh, the EU recently took an extraordinary step, unprecedented for the EU, saying that for Ukrainian refugees coming in for, what, uh, three years, they could move anywhere inside the member states? First of all, let me say it's a positive development for the European Union. I'm proud as a member of the Council that we voted on the 4th of March to activate the 2001 directive that has never been used before. It allows citizens of Ukraine, their families, and recognized refugees in Ukraine to arrive visa-free in any European Union country, being granted automatically a 12-month work permit, which will probably be renewed for 12 more months, given access to housing, um, food if needed, and to the job market, of course, access to medical care. This is open to all Ukrainians. We abolished uh, internal borders within the European Union, borders that were created 30 years ago with the Dublin regulation that prevents other refugees from moving from one country to another. And I think the High Commission raised a very interesting point that we have a Dublin standard here. And that's something the EU needs to talk about. And I have raised this issue uh, a year ago at the European Parliament saying that Europe needs to be able to provide a common protection space for refugees within the European Union. But I think the most critical message from the panel up to now is that we're talking about Ukraine, but we can't forget so many other crises around the world. Mm -hmm. Greece has welcomed more than one million refugees from Syria and Afghanistan since 2015. On top of one million refugees we welcomed in the 90s from Eastern Europe. So we know very well the pressure from uh, refugee crisis. Um, I think Europe needs to do more in an organized way to provide shelter to people in need from around the world. And I think we need to do so in an organized way, not to provide work for smugglers that activate themselves in the refugee community. And a lot of people in suffering pay thousands of dollars to be put in very dangerous trips, either from Libya or from other Eastern Mediterranean routes, to come to Europe. People fleeing a country from war should be given access. People living from safe places to a better future, they should come. We're very much in favor of promoting migration, but in an organized way, and Europe needs to act collectively in that front. Now, the final point I wanted to make is about opportunities. And I think Europe is acting very well in ensuring that refugees in Europe are given the opportunities to ensure we don't have a lost generation. When people come in the European Union and they're asylum seekers or recognized refugees, they have access to schooling, they have the right to work. All refugees in Europe and in Greece have automatically the right to work. They have access to health care. They have a monthly allowance in line with the local population. In Greece, recognized refugees and Greek nationals receive exactly the same social benefits and that's the norm within the European Union. But I think we cannot expect single countries to be able to tackle global problems. We need, in an organized way, the European Union to find common solutions. Lastly, we were among the first countries to participate in the voluntary relocation of Afghan female leaders. We have 800 in Greece. We're very proud. And we hope we will be able to do more in the weeks and months to come. Uh, Minister, that's a great uh, transition for us to focus a, a little bit more on steps we should be taking going forward to deal with what we all recognize is uh, n not only more than the responsibility of a single country or a small block of countries, but, but the world, but also that this is long term. This is not going to go away next week, tomorrow. So uh, I, I appreciate you, your, um, your description of that. And of course, your country has been on the front lines in so many ways. At least from uh, your perspective and focusing for a moment on vulnerable girls and women, and, and we know that um, they are vulnerable to the worst kinds of exploitative forces 
what more should we be doing to try to help them during this time of vulnerability? In Ukraine or anywhere? Uh, anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. Well, maybe we, I'll... We can I'll, spin, the, spin the globe, sadly, yeah. and stop almost anywhere. Well, I think one of the things that's very alarming to us right now that we're seeing in Ukraine is all of a sudden a shift, right? Um, of course, you talked about um, the floods of women and children crossing, and in some ways there's that safety, and it's women and children traveling together, but of course that shifts very quickly. And we are seeing a rise of exploitation, we are seeing the beginnings of human trafficking, um, and we are also seeing the beginnings of rape as a weapon of war inside um, Ukraine uh, by Russian soldiers. There was two reports now of this. Um, and I think for, for all of us, what, what we are trying to do, and I think I would say this is what we need to do in any country, um, we in initially sent a team out to, uh, to the borders, to Poland, to Moldova, Romania, and I think we saw you know, incredible support there. Um, obviously an outpouring from throughout Europe and, and beyond. But one of the things that we found is that the many women leaders that we've been working with for 25 years, our entire history, um, in Ukraine, running small NGOs, shelters, hotlines were all of a sudden being activated. And the, you know, shelters with, you know, 60 beds with now supporting, you know, thousands of people um, as a transit point, as an information clearing house. And these are organizations that had no money. And so I think it, it, while it's very important to support the large institutions and, and what's happening at the border as people flee, the vast majority um, of women and children in Ukraine are actually internally displaced and are moving, right? And how do we keep them safe in that moving? And what we're supporting right now, just trying to get money out quickly because we don't know how much longer we'll get money into their hands, is to activate this network of small women's nonprofits that are connected to each other already at that sort of security line, the information clearing house. Um, and I would encourage others to do the same, is to look at country at those who are there um, and those who are taking so much income who don't have time to apply for grants, um, you know, who don't have time to take the calls. I've, I've been talking with them at midnight their time when they finally have a moment to speak with me about some of their needs. Um, but I think, I think we need to do a better job of, of finding those, that infrastructure that exists and investing in it. Um, and I think also encouraging people to provide cash rather than, um, you know, the, the floods of coats my team told me they saw at the various borders, which is a lovely sentiment. People love to send things, but at the end of the day, you know, supply chains will, will kick in. Uh, that's a next nice transition, Flipo. I noticed recently some discussion of the cash assistance that your agency is providing. Talk a little bit about those cash assistance programs. I think this was in the context of Ukraine. Perhaps it's yeah. in numerous places. And if I may take this opportunity mm. to broaden this a bit, Please. To cash, but a bit broader. You know what uh, uh, Minister al what I'm an, uh, said is very important, what both ministers said. You know, the Refugee Convention, in its preamble, stipulates that refugees are in international responsibility because refugees, by definition, have lost national protection, so they are now not the responsibility of the next country alone, as often is the case, but of the international. First of all, much more practical. You know, we, can, we are scaling up a program with the Polish government and Caritas Poland for 150,000 families in literally, we'll do it in a couple of weeks. We can scale up like that. So it's quite practical. It's much more dignified because people then decide how they want to use that cash. And, uh, and it's a bit more of an inve investment of the future should that situation become protracted. Because when it becomes protracted, like the Jordan situation, there is where in areas where we know that sustainability will be key. And this is why, you know, Jordan is such 
a phenomenal example, the examples that were given by the minister in terms of work permits, in terms of inclusion in schools. You know, I often say, and my legal colleagues cringe a bit, but I'll say it anyway, inclusion is the new protection, right? It's including refugees in services to the extent possible in the job market through appropriate investment is really the future of mid-term assistance for large displaced populations. I'm not talking about integration and nationalization, which in most countries is very, very difficult socially, demographically, and politically. I'm talking about inclusion until needed with a strong focus always on solutions. Because Ayman is right. You know, we need to keep thinking about solution even when it is difficult. And if the people huddle in the evening around the table and decide, is it safe for me? Can my kids go to school if I go back to my country? And the answer is no. We have to look at that country and see how we can help conditions there become conducive for return. But that also is a development investment. So my conclusion is that really the shift has happened, I think, with the big arrivals in, in Europe in 2015-16. People started thinking in a new way. We have phenomenal cooperation with institutions like the World Bank that has created entire financial instruments to deal with this, and I think that this is the future. Displacement is also a development challenge and not just a humanitarian one, both for the people that are displaced and for the communities and countries that host them. So early on, uh, Filippo made uh, reference to ODA, and for us development geeks, that's official development assistance. And it's important because uh, there is a real concern, I think, that humanitarian assistance, which is vitally important right now, will begin to cannibalize ODA. And it, I think what we're hearing is it is crucial to retain that development, those development tools, so for the long-term displacement and the host communities around them, you continue to focus on development, have a vibrant economy, so that people are not wards of the state, that this doesn't become a perpetual condition. And it is important to make sure that we remember, uh, we remember both. Um, Minister Safadi, uh, when I take a look at the extraordinary um, hospitality and generosity of your government for quite some time now, what suggestions would you make for the world community and what we should be thinking about and what we should be doing to help the Jordans of the world during this time of challenge? Thank you. I, I think the, 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 the simple answer is think long term. Uh, as Filippo said, initially at the beginning of refugee crisis, the needs are usually emergency relief, tents, food, water, you know, other, other resources. But a few years into that, it becomes a developmental issues. It becomes how do I provide schools to the kids who are born or grow up to schooling age? How do I provide universities? How do I provide jobs? Uh, 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 how do I provide hope? Uh, and again, not, not surrender them to, to despair. So uh, that has been our experience is that usually, you know, people come in driven by emotions, by the immediacy of the moments and come in. But then as things kind of settle down, they stop seeing the, you know, it's no longer news headlines, so it becomes a matter of daily life. People get used to it, but that doesn't mean the problem has, has developed, has, has uh, vanished. Thing is, again, most of the refugees ultimately leave camps. Again, as said in Jordan, only 10% in camps. And where do they go to? They go to already underprivileged areas. They're not going to be able uh, to afford rent or living in, in some of the you know middle class or higher. So they go to areas where already you don't have enough economic activity, already people are stressed, you don't have a lot of jobs. And the other dynamic that needs to be looked at is not just refugees, but again, the host communities where they're un interacting with them on a daily basis. So you need to create an ecosystem that would ensure support for refugees and ensure support for the host communities so that they continue to embrace refugees and instead of having a negative dynamic, you have a positive dynamic where they start sharing uh, uh, their, their livelihoods as they uh, uh, do. So I think ultimately we need to think longer term and we really need to think comprehensively. We cannot afford to move from one crisis to the other. 
uh, and forget the immediate crisis once a new one uh, uh, emerges. Unfortunately, in my part of the world, uh, we have too many, <laughs> you know, I mean, and they're not ending. And on the contrary, instead of getting better, they, they get, they're getting worse. Uh, and again, thinking long term, 12 million kids in the Arab world of school going age are not going to school. What are we going to do with this? Five years, 10 years. I have to think long term because, you know, we're living with them. We are in the middle of the crisis. My country has been at the receiving end of every crisis. We have refugees from 58 countries in Jordan, not just Syria and Palestine, you know. So, uh, again, we do, we try to do the right thing, but we need our partners to help us do the right thing. I have to say again, once again, to emphasize that we got tremendous support from from our partners and from UN uh, uh, agencies. And we work together in beautiful partnership. Filippo was head of UNRWA before he was head of UNHCR. So our partnership goes back many, many years. And we do what we can. But what we warn against is that the, we cannot forget the refugees' issues because it's no longer headline, because they're no longer in camps, because you know they're not very pictorially you know, sort of uh, attractive situations. No, people could be living in a camp or could be living in a small uh, apartment, uh, you know, down, downtown. They're having the same problems. Uh, and again, it, it really is interconnected. You know, women abuse. If you provide women with education, if you provide them with protection, you're protecting women. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's not just against radicalization. It's, it's against being abused. It's against criminal activity, it's against, uh, and look, you know, evidence has shown that the biggest ally of radicalism, by the way, is ignorance, mm. even more than the than, than need. When people are not educated, when people do not sort of understand the, 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 uh, how things are going, then they're easily preyed on and they're easily turned. So we empower refugees and by doing so we protect our countries, we protect our neighbors. Uh, back to the issue of Europe, and, and we, we work very, very closely. Uh, I think the Syrian crisis has shown how interconnected we are. Mm. Uh, 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 and uh, Europe had had to deal with the, with, with the shocks of the mm. Syrian crisis. We had to deal with more. But ultimately, Europe knows that if refugees are not taken care of in the immediate region, they're going to make that, 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 that really dangerous journey across, across the water to go into Europe. So, even from an economic perspective, the cost of sustaining a refugee in the region is a fragment of the cost of sustaining refugee in, in, in Europe. From a cultural dimension, if a Syrian refugee in Amman, Syria is, Damascus is two hours drive from Amman. Same language, very similar culture, so the chances of them going back is there. But if, imagine if a five-year-old kid goes to Germany, when he's or she's 20, right. what links do they have to their, to their previous culture? In, in, in Minister Midarachi, before we go to an audience question or two. Um, so the EU, Europe, hasn't always agreed on everything. Um, the, re the remarkable uh, vote that's taken place, again, around opening uh, movement for Ukrainian refugees, what do you see as the next steps that Europe, the EU, might undertake uh, given the likelihood that the refugee flows are going to be long-term? First of all, with regard to Ukraine, I have to tell you what my Polish colleague told me a few days ago, that the first hope these people have is to go home. Most of the Ukrainians that have come to Europe, they aspire to go home as soon as possible. So we're not certain yet whether it will be a humanitarian crisis or a development crisis back in Ukraine. I would hope it's the latter. Um, now, people leave their countries for many reasons. They leave because of authoritarian uh, regimes in war, or they're being pushed by authoritarian regimes. We should remember what happened with Belarus. The case with Belarus versus Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland demonstrates how sometimes authoritarian regimes are using people for political gains. Europe needs to do more to tackle other sources of, of migration. We're talking about climate changes, we're talking about the need for support for economic growth at countries of origin and countries of transit. And I think that's where we need to do much more. The cost truly, when it comes to Europe, it's much, much higher. I will agree with my esteemed colleague from Jordan. 
For example, in the case of Greece, we invested in the last seven years, just through UNHCR and IOM, one billion euros for the protection of people that came through our country for this period of time. So the cost that Europe has to uh, spend within Europe, it's a multiple of what would be spent if it's done regionally. But more importantly, these people that are leaving their countries for, because of war or political reasons, the fact of the matter is their aspiration is to return to their countries. And I think it's important that these people are given the opportunity by being supported locally to, to return one day back. Now, when they come to Europe, I would like to emphasize this point again, inclusion is a given. And I think that's a very important part of the European values. When people come and seek refugee in Europe and are recognized in Europe as refugees, then they have all the tools of starting their life again. And I think that's a very important characteristic of the European Union. May I yes, just one, one thing, my friend, from, again, from a country who's uh, said the largest per capita host of refugees, ask that question in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Again, if the crisis is not solved and people do not have the chance to go back immediately to their countries, in 10 years, they're going to have lost a lot of connection to their countries. And if a village is destroyed and a family has no house to go to, they've got no reason to go. So yes, immediately, everybody wants to go back. But 10, 15 years down the line, people build new lives. And, and, and unless they have a reason to go back, uh, they're not going to go back. So for now, yes. But give it 10, 15 years, the answer would be different. That's why I said in such cases, a development, then opportunity. How do we quickly go back and help rebuild countries that went through Absolutely. very fixed Absolutely. experiences, like in the case and, of Ukraine, our, Syria. Isn't what we're really saying here that regardless, it's crucial that those who are displaced, particularly women and children, are given the schools, uh, the training, the resources, so that either, God willing, they can go home and build a life, or if they are not going home, that they're able to do so there. Yeah. Right? I mean, we all agree upon that, and so those skill needs are very important. One thing I will say, uh, in my days at USAID, visiting a refugee camp under uh, Filippo's uh, jurisdiction, if you will, one of the most uplifting things that I saw was uh, essentially some small shops where women had been given cash to actually purchase their own food. And even though in those small shops there weren't a lot of choices, nonetheless, the human dignity for each of those women to be able to go in and barter like hell, arguing for the prices, was uplifting. And you realized that human dignity was preserved, human dignity was upheld, and again, God willing, someday that, uh, that woman and her family will be able to go out into the broader world, they'll be well prepared. And so I think it's an extraordinarily important feature of the resources that, uh, that you provide. Do we have, we have just a few moments. I see a question in the back. Thank you very much for the inspiring words. I have a couple of comments. One first comment on the um, refugee crisis, I guess. One of the things that has been mentioning is that we need to rebuild the country so refugees can go back. But in the case of so many crises, the rebuilding only is not the solution because people are also fleeing from persecution and uh, getting into jail. So political reform also is important, not just restructuring of the country or rebuilding the country in terms of cities and schools and services. The other thing is, it's really wonderful to hear uh, His Excellency Flippo talk about the Nexus humanitarian development nexus. But uh, this is also a journey that we need to intake, and this is not really happening very fast. We need to revise our humanitarian programs to ensure that this nexus is being implemented. One more thing that needs to be addressed is localization. And this is the case of many, um, I think, civil societies. They want to see themselves in the position where they feed into the solutions because they have the tools, they have the flexibility, they have their small hands instead of the government or UN agencies with their uh, big, uh, let's say, they have their big mechanisms and sometimes those big mechanisms need a lot of time to be on the move. 
why the localization is important. Localization should also be included in the um, return mechanism monitoring because those right holders also need to be included. I don't know if any of these would be included in the discussion. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. I agree very much with point number one and point number three. So I don't, <laughs> I can just endorse what you said. On point number two, you know, everybody talks about the nexus, nexus. You know, we, I, I belong to an organization, luckily, that is quite practical. And I can give you an example. Uh, the World Bank, I mentioned it earlier quickly, the World Bank has established a number of financial instruments to help countries hosting large numbers of refugees. There's an instrument for middle-income countries called the Global Concessional Financing Facility, and there's an income for developing countries uh, called Host Community and Refugee Window. Just this last one, for each uh, cycle that the bank, I think, is three years, is $2.2 billion, so it's not small. And how does it work? You know, the bank selects the countries that there's some criteria, and then it's bilateral. It's been between the bank and the country itself. It's a lot of grants. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated. It's concessional loans. And UNHCR, as the protection organization, gives advice, but is not involved. This is the nexus. You know, this is the nexus. This is how, you know, you tackle an issue that is traditionally humanitarian with development resources. And what, does, what is this money for? Is yeah. to strengthen school system, health systems, to strengthen the local economy or, or institution of the states dealing with this matter. So, especially in Africa, we have really, in about a dozen country, countries, made a lot of strides. And this is the nexus in action that is already happening. And this is just an example. We have time for one last question. I saw there a gentleman with the microphone. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Abbas Barzgar. I've spent years teaching and researching about the Muslim humanitarian sector, and the question follows the financing uh, comment that you just made, uh, High Commissioner. And Ambassador Green, if you could speak to this as well. As you know, after 9-11, uh, global financial controls on counterterrorism finance really suffocated a lot of transnational Muslim civil society. These organizations tend to be the very best place to solve many, many problems. So how do you see the need for innovative financing? Um, how do you see that need being met, or I should say obstructed by the kind of counterterrorism finance regulations that exist that stifle that type of, that type of space? Um, we basically have a situation where the capacity of civil society groups is decreasing, and localization possibilities decrease because of some of these international regulations. Any comments to that would be great. My only comment, I don't mind, please. Uh, my only comment would be that we are always striving to ensure that, let's call them broadly, sanctions-related uh, constraints or measures do not impact humanitarian work. That's what we always try to do. Beyond that, it's a bit difficult for us to intervene in what is essentially a political discussion, but we're always trying to avoid that there is this negative impact. Then there's other factors that I cannot comment here, they're probably case by case. But I don't know if you want. No, I, I just say like transparency is key here. I mean, uh, we've got to be careful that money is given to yeah. NGOs that are really doing the job for its declared purpose. Uh, it's not without proof that some NGOs try to uh, condition support on subscribing to certain ideologies or practices. So I think ultimately, if you have good governance and if you had good transparency, we should be able to deal with it. But we cannot allow, again, uh, 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 to provide uh, tools to, uh, you know, sort of any entity that operates in the dark. Again, transparency, good governance, that should take care of it. So I want to thank our wonderful set of panelists here for this discussion. I think they've done a tremendous job. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to thank our hosts for willing to take up this discussion. And of course, as we began thanking the government of Qatar for its extraordinary efforts on human displacement, particularly in places like Afghanistan. If you would like to read the Wilson quarterly issue on human displacement, you can go to the Wilson Center website and you'll see some of the uh, articles that we referenced. And beyond that, thanks to all of you and thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you.